By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I have something sweet for you because I got some really, really positive uh, feedback from you guys. So thank you very much for that on my Chronicles video and my video about Fallen Empire. So these are little videos where I share parts of my collection. So today I thought, okay, let's share another part. Maybe you recognize this binder. This is the same kind of binder that held my, my Chronicles collection. Um, and in this episode, I would like to share with you my Antiquities collection. And Antiquities, um, I've got the full set here in this binder. Here we go. This is the first page of the set. And Antiquities was the first set that I ever collected. So I was um, 12 when I started collecting this set. I believe it was 1996. And it was really difficult to get all these cards. Not because of the price, but more... Well, also because of the price, because I was 12. I had no money. But, but more because you didn't have internet. You didn't have all that stuff in 1996. So I had to travel throughout the country and I live in the Netherlands. So it's, if, I mean, I don't know if you know about the country, it's a small country, uh, but still when you're 12, even, you know, a city that's only an hour away is a huge undertaking because you need other people to get you there. So I had an older brother, but I also needed, you know, my parents, I, I needed to money from other people to buy train tickets and all that stuff. So it wasn't always easy. And now that I think about it, I probably was 13. I probably was a little bit older. When I, when I started collecting antiquities, going alone on the train. Um, so here we see the first page of antiquities. And in this video, I would like to tell you a little bit about the set as well, and just go through some of my favorite cards and go, go through some of the, the flavor of this set. Because what makes this set so special for me is that it's the first set, it's the first magic expansion that was released with a coherent story. It had the story behind the set and its story came back in the art of the cards, it came back in the name of the cards, it came back in the whole mechanic of the cards. So it's 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 one of those first sets where everything really came together and kind of made sense. It's different. Arabian Nights, of course, being a beautiful set as well. That set was the first Magic expansion ever. But that set was um, inspired by uh, the 1001 Arabian Nights, but it, it wasn't... Um, it didn't have its own story. So, of course, everybody knows the story of the Antiquities, the Brothers' War. And I will also tell you a little bit about the Brothers' War based on the cards that we're going to see. And actually, there's quite a nice example um, of a little bit of a story here in the card in the middle. And actually, almost all the cards, but why not just take out this one? Um, this card here is Ashnot's uh, Transmogrant. And Ashnot refers... Oh, let, let me see if I can, if I can get the... Uh, if I can get the camera to kind of work with us here. There we go, that's better. Ashnot was actually, um, was the assistant of Mishra in the Brothers' War. And one of the things that you'll notice about Ashnot's cards is that they're all pretty cruel. She was a cruel woman, you know, she was an artificer and she didn't mind hurting people to kind of find out new things and to, um, to kind of cross that border between a living being and a machine. So let's kind of read. Here we see the flavor text. Ashnot found few willing to trade their humanity for the power she offered them. Right? So for her, it was all about power and to see how you can improve human beings with machinery. So that kind of reminds you of Phyrexia already, right? And we see even more cards like that, like Ashnot's Battle Gear, uh, Ashnot's uh, Altar. It's all about you know, sacrificing. It's not really that feeling of, ooh, nice. And under um, Ashnot's Transmogrant, there's one another epic, epic card from, from this set. And that is the Candelabra of Taunus. This is actually a card that I acquired much, much later um, when I kind of started to become interested in, um, in Magic the Gathering again. And let's take a look. I'll just take it out of the sleeve. It's quite nice condition. Obviously, the centering is uh, is far from ideal. But this is called the Candelabra of Taunus. So you might wonder, okay, who's Taunus? Well, we can read that from the uh, flavor text here. Because Taunus learned quickly from Urza that utter simplicity often led to wondrous yet subtle utility. So Candelabra of Taunus refers 
to the assist in the right hand of Urza. So both brothers had uh, an artificer that was their right hand and that supported them in whatever they did. And you can find references to, to Ashnan and to uh, Taunus all over the set of, um, of antiquities. But maybe let's first start at the start and that is who developed, who developed the set because it was actually not uh, Garfield that developed this set. It was designed by the core group of the University of Pennsylvania that helped Richard Garfield develop Magic the Gathering because at the start he had a plan. He made many test groups uh, that helped him to kind of develop the game of Magic the Gathering. So those people that were involved from the early stages of Alpha also designed uh, this uh, this set antiquities. So for me, that only makes the set even better that the people that designed it were people that were magickers through and through. They knew the set. And I'm not surprised that a card like Ashnaut's Battle Gear, for example, here um, has been the inspiration of designing cards like equipment later in the game. So a lot of mechanics and, and things we see in this, uh, in this set have been the start of so many more interesting developments in the game of Magic the Gathering. So it was um, released, I don't know if I, if I said that already, but it was released in March of 1994. And uh, the set, let's get a, let's get a card of, of uh, Dominaria, a map Dominaria. Um, this map is actually designed by uh, Jared uh, Blando. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And he also has a Patreon page. I will, uh, in the description below, I will put place a link to his Patreon page where you can find more information because I think you can even order this card if you want to. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll put links and, and links to, to his websites in the description down below. But if we look at this uh, map, this obviously is a map of Dominaria. That's where uh, this whole uh, antiquity story takes place. Like, like everything in early magic, it all took place on the plain of Dominaria. And if we look at the right side, if you look closely, you will see a continent and that's named Terra Sierra. Terra Sierra? I'm not, I'm probably <laughs> not pronouncing this correctly. But anyway, it's the continent where this whole story um, takes place. And it tells the story about two brothers, Mishra and Urza. And when you think about Mishra and Urza, you're probably thinking about the manland. So if we take a look here, here we see the, the first ones. And now let me just take this one out. Here we go. Let me check. So this is obviously for a lot of people their favorite card of the factories mishra's factory right here and obviously mishra referring to the youngest brother mishra because they were brothers but one was older than the other as you often have and mishra was the younger brother and here we see probably the most or probably i think the most valuable card out of the set i remember trading this uh, in Utrecht, in a cellar, in a game store called The Joker. It's actually still there at the game store. And um, I already realized when I traded it, I'm not sure what I traded it for, I can't remember, but I already realized when I was trading this, like, okay, this is special. It was already kind of common knowledge back in those days that, that a land that could do something was something special. So, but I mean, I didn't realize at the time that this card would ever be this valuable. So obviously really, really happy with it and also with the memories attached to this card. So this is Mishra's workshop, obviously referring to Mishra. When you think about Urza, you're probably thinking about the Urza land, lands also called the Tron lands. So let me just get an example here. Um, this is art-wise one of my personal favorites. This one. And this is the Urza's tower. And already when you look at the cards, you can kind of see the difference between the characters of the brothers, where the uh, Urza, the older brother, is really an artificer that has more of a relationship with his devices than with people. And Mishra, the younger brother, he's much more, he's more rough. He's more a person that just goes out there and wants to explore and discover things and is not afraid for anything but he's also a little bit frustrated because his brother is, is, is so calm and so icy and uh, he feels like his brother is not taking him seriously. So he wants to be taken seriously by his brother and kind of that relationship between the two brothers um, kind of leads 
leads to the war eventually. Um, and talking about their relationship, um, early early in the story, when their story begins, they were sent to um, the, the Villaggi, Villaggi Desert. Again, it's hard to pronounce these names. Um, so they're sent to the desert because their dad has died and they're sent to the desert with a letter and they need to bring that letter to uh, Tokasia. And Tokasia is the um, founder of a very big dig site in the Falaji Desert. And um, she kind of has a school there for students that are interested in, in the history of the continent. And what they do there is they, they dig up ancient artifacts and artifacts that are linked to the Thran Empire. And this Thran Empire is believed to be this ancient empire uh, that once was on the continent, but they don't know a lot about it. So they're, they're finding all these magical devices and they're trying to put them together and they're trying to see what they can do. And again, uh, uh, Tokasia is one of those people that's often referred to within the set. So I can show you a few really nice examples that refer to Tokasia. And when you're reading the book, and I guess uh, you can see the cover now of the two brothers, when you're reading the book, you realize what big of a deal Tokasia is actually playing um, in the development of the brothers as brilliant artificers. Like she teaches them everything that they that they know and that they built upon later on. Um, here, for example, we see Suchi. That might be a nice car to, to kind of have a look at here. Um, we see Suchi and we can read the flavor text here. Flawed copies of relics from the Thran Empire. The Suchi were inherently unstable, but provided useful knowledge for Tokasia's students. So the students they're referring to, two of those students are actually Mishra and Urza. And Suchi, I believe, means uh, four in Chinese Mandarin, hence four four and four to cast. So it's, it's one of those perfectly balanced cards. And of course, when it dies, you gain four mana, but that can also give you four mana burn. So it's like highly unstable. And maybe nice for me, what I always see in the art of this card is the face of a cobra and kind of a brain here where it's open. Um, but I understand that a lot of people see different things in the artwork. Some people say I more or less see a cane in the artwork. So it would be nice if you could let me know um, what you see in this specific piece of art. But this is the Suchi and you see that reference to Tokasia. And when you go through um, through the whole set, like I have right now in front of me, I have that luxury, you can kind of see a lot of references to her and, and to the actual story. Um, and if we go, oh yeah, this is another great one. And this is actually like in the people, for the people who have actually read the book, uh, you already know this, but the Grape Shot Catapult, uh, let's let's read the, the text here. For years, scholars debated whether these were Urza's or Mishra's creations. Recent research suggests that they were invented by the brother's original master, Tokasia, and that both used these devices. And that's actually correct when you read the book. You read that the encampment in the Falaji Desert is protected by these grapeshot catapults because they need protection from raiders and whatnot and and other like felons that roam around in the desert. It's not necessarily a safe place. And these catapults originally uh, also linked to that Thran dynasty. So uh, Tokasia is much more than just the leader of a school. She's really a great artificer as well. And I think the last card that I can show you that really links to her that might be interesting to take a look at is Onulet. And here Onulet, an early inspiration for Urza, Tokasia's Onulets contain magical essences that could be cannibalized after they stop functioning. So again, this is what I like so much is where flavor text and actually ability of the card come together. Because when the Onulet dies, you actually gain two life, right? And um, in the story, the Onulet is, is used kind of as an oxen to move things and, and over the desert. So all the equipment when they're moving in the Falaji Desert and they want to go to a new dig site. So that's pretty interesting. And let's take a look. So um, we have these. Um, I, I discussed earlier that both Mishra and Urza had um, assistants, but maybe before we go to the assistants, I want to show you another card that actually when it came out, and I mean, I wasn't 
aware of that at the time, but when it came out, people thought this card was just ridiculous because you paid no mana cost and you got an O2 flyer. So people really like this card is way too powerful. So imagine it was a completely different look on the game. People really looked at how much mana do you have to spend to cast something um, instead of really looking at, I guess, the card itself. I mean, still, it's a good card. Ornithopter is a very interesting card. Um, the reason I'm showing this card is because this is one of the early uh, inventions uh, of Urza. So if we also look at the flavor text here, it reads, many scholars believe that these creatures were the results of Urza's first attempt at mechanical life, perhaps created in his early days as an apprentice of Tokasia. And that's actually correct if you read, if you read the book, of course. Um, they find parts of the Ornithopter and uh, its ancient Thran technology and then Urza is fascinated by him, by them and he actually creates them, so he makes them. Again, this is very frustrating for Mishra because um, Urza is not really letting him work on the Ornithopter and when the Ornithopter is finished, they both fly with it and Tokasia also flies with it and at a certain point they make multiple Ornithopters and they go and discover um, the Falaji Desert together. And what happens is when they're discovering the Falaji Desert, they find the caves of Koilos. Now the caves of Koilos is where it gets even more interesting because in the caves they find something called a power stone. And that power stone, what happens is they find the power stone and I'm just going to take two cards out there because they're very important in the story. Um, they find the power stone, they get into this huge argument and they're both holding a piece of the stone and they don't want to share the stone, they start pulling at the stone and this stone, this power stone is highly unstable. So it starts making a sound. At a certain point it explodes and both brothers kind of wake up at opposite sides of the caves and having a part of the power stone in hand. And Urza actually has, or sorry, Mishra actually has this, this one, the uh, weak stone. And uh, Mishra has or Urza has the Might Stone. Sorry, I'm completely mixing this up. So just to clarify, Urza has the Might Stone and Mishra has the Weak Stone. Now, what I find so fascinating is that when you read the uh, flavor text, it, uh, it doesn't tell that story. It tells a different story because let, let's just read them. While exploring the sacred cave of Koilos with his brother Mishra and their master Tokasia, Urza fell behind in a hole of, of Taxin where he discovered the remarkable Might Stone. So here it's written down as if he discovered the stone and Mishra wasn't there. And when we read the flavor text of the weak stone, we read the following. During the brothers' childhood, Tokasia took them to explore the sacred cave of Koilos. There in the hole of Taxin, Mishra discovered the mysterious weak stone. So there is no mention of it once being one power stone being divided into two stones. So that's different than the actual story in the book. Another thing what I find so interesting is that in the book, when you read it, you think, wow, these must be incredibly powerful stones. You know, they must do something spectacular. And then, I mean, they're, they're, they're interesting and they're kind of on flavor in the way that they affect the whole board. Like, if we look at the weak stone, all attacking creatures lose minus one, minus O. Oh. If we look at the might stone, all attacking creatures gain plus one, plus O. Oh. So it has this board wide effect. But um, when I discovered about these cards and I, I acquired these cards, I was actually a little bit disappointed uh, about their value, to be honest. I mean, I thought, whoa, these cards are going to be some of the most powerful um, cards in the whole of magic. And then I looked at them and was like, okay, you know, they're not. Too bad, I guess, if I played in a goblin deck or something or whatever, but they, they weren't as powerful as I, um, as I expected. So um, the fact that they had these two stones kind of fueled their, um, their, the competitiveness that was already there between the two brothers. And uh, Tokasia actually tried to uh, convince Urza and Mishra you know, to give them the stones so she could study them and she could kind of be the referee between the two brothers because she could see that these stones um, kind of created an even bigger gap between them and more animosity between the two brothers. 
And what eventually happened is that during one of the heated arguments where Urza wanted the weak stone and, and Mishra wanted the might stone uh, to put them back together, um, in an attempt of Tokesia to, to kind of get the brothers to find peace again, she died. So there was, there was a fight between the brothers. She tried to step in. Uh, she tried the brothers to make commands with each other, but she died. And then Mishra looked at uh, Tokasia's, Tokasia's dead body and was like, okay, this is too much. And he fled into the Falaji desert. And that was kind of the end of the, the whole dig site and the whole camp of uh, uh, Tokasia. Also, because Urza was not really a leader. So despite the fact that Urza stayed, nobody wanted to follow Urza. Nobody cared for much for Urza because Urza was always focused on his machines. And then later in the story, they each find their own way and they eventually uh, find their own apprentices and become powerful where Urza is linked to Taunus and uh, Mishra is linked to Ashnot. So it might be interesting for Taunus, we already looked at the candelabra of Taunus, but um, you also have Taunus's coffin. Let's have a look at Taunus's coffin, which I th it's just such cool artwork, it's just beautiful. And, you know, Taunus's coffin is kind of an effect that you also see in modern cards. So Taunus's coffin is four to cast. A mono artifact, meaning you need to tap it. You can only use it once. Three and tap. Uh, select a creature in play. That creature is considered out of play as long as the coffin remains tapped. Hence, the creature cannot be the target of spells and cannot receive damage, use special powers, attack or defend. All counters and enchantments on the creature remain, but are also out of play. If coffin is untapped or removed, or removed, creatures um, the creature returns to play tapped. You may choose not to untap the coffin during the untap phase. So, it's basically it's exiling the creature. And of course, now in modern magic, you, sh you should see many cards inspired on this card. And talking about cards that are inspired, um, there is another great invention by Thomas. One of personally one of my favorite cards to play with, as a mage that enjoys playing with artifacts. And that is, of course, Triskelion. And Triskelion is one of those cards that enters the battlefield with three plus one plus one counters on it, and you can start shooting those counters. So you can use those counters for something else. Um, and here we see the flavor text referring to Taunus, a brainchild of Taunus, the Triskelion proved its versatility and usefulness in many of the later, later battles between the brothers. So it, it might be nice to know if you enjoy flavor, when they're referring to Taunus, you can make the link with Urza. When they're referring to Ashnot, you can make the link with uh, Mishra. And let's say, oh, this is also an interesting one, actually. There's this card that I'm seeing now. And this is Yoshin Soldier. So Yoshin Soldier, actually when you look at Yoshin, there's the word toy in there, because this was called Toy Soldier by the development team. And Yoshin Soldier 3, it's a 1-4, and attacking does not cost Yoshin Soldier to tap. So it's it's a pretty strong card defensively, actually. Uh, and also the, the texture is quite interesting, because it reads, After Krug was destroyed, while most of its defenders were at his side, Urza vowed that none of his allies would ever need to fear for their own defense again even while laying siege to a city far from their homes. Because what happened in the book is um, eventually Urza marries the daughter of the king of Krug, the city of Krug. And um, at a certain point, he finds his brother again. Obviously, they get into some kind of fight, argument, etc., etc. They go into the Falaji Desert to meet, to discuss a truce. And while they're doing that, um, the city of Krug is destroyed. So Yoshin soldiers, the flavor text there is referring to that event. And again, that is what I love so much about antiquities. The story is everywhere. It's everywhere in the cards. It's, it's just, it's fantastic. And of course, there are some quirky cards. Talking about quirky cards, we've got the Argivian Archaeologist, which is one of my favorite cards, but definitely a quirky card. If you look at the art here, um, I mean, he looks like this dude from the 70s. And I know I've said this before in another video, but they call him the shirt because the pants that he's wearing, the khaki pants, you can't really see them. So it's almost like he's only wearing 
uh, a t-shirt and that's it. But the, the strange thing about this is, is that this card is taking you out of the world of magic. You're actually seeing quite a bit an archaeologist, one archaeologist does what in our day, I guess. So it really looks like this, this 70s archaeologist dude. It doesn't really look like um, a person, a character that would be in, in the magic world or that would be on this, um, in this Brothers War era. So that's, that's quite interesting. Again, the flavor text is nice. You know, fascinated by the lore of ancient struggles, the archaeologists, archaeologist searches unsen, un, ooh, unsesen, un, as, pff, I can't pronounce this, man. I can't do it. But he's searching for remnants of an earlier, more powerful, powerful era. And of course, that refers, or at least when I read it, I feel like this refers to the Thran uh, era, to the Thran dynasty, because they they keep looking for these ancient devices left by the Thran people. So let me just get this back into the binder. Um, yeah, this is kind of like the story that I wanted to share with you. And, um, maybe it's interesting to just go through it page at a time, so you can really take take a good look at this uh, at this collection. And let me just see. So here we go. And we see, of course, Ashnot Altar, Ashnot's Battle Gear, Ashnot's Transmogrant, Battering Ram. I mean, I'm, it's not really something you can do with this, but it is It is one of the only artifacts with banding. So that could make it interesting. But you can only ban it when attacking. So it does make sense flavor-wise because you've got a Battering Ram. So, I mean, you're attacking with it. You're not defending with a Battering Ram. That wouldn't work really well. Here we see Amulet of Krug. Again, that's referring to the city of Krug, one of the allies of Urza. It's really nice. And if we look at the other page, this is another creature that was really remarkable of the antiquities. This is the Colossus of Sardia. Look at that. I mean, this was the biggest creature until uh, the dark where you had this 1111 um, trampler, blue creature. Uh, I can't get the name right now, um, but it's it's a beautiful card as well. But at the time, the Colossus of Sardia was the biggest creature in the game. Um, and the lore behind this creature is actually that Mishra made it. It's a golem. So Mishra made it uh, and it got destroyed in the end because what happened at the end, um, whole of the, of the continent where the story takes place actually got destroyed by this card, the Golgathian Silex, and that was used by Urza. So Urza actually activated the Silex. The Silex destroyed both of their armies uh, and, and, and much, much more. And that was the end of the Brothers' War. And um, because of the destruction and the power of the Silex, uh, the continent started to cool down. And that was actually the start of Ice Age. So this was this detonation of the Silex was the start of, of Ice Age. And also when you look in the lore of Fallen Empire, for example, uh, the Homerids, the Homerids, they are all of a sudden uh, attacking Fodalian uh, merfolk, for example, because the waters are getting colder. So now the Homerids can go deeper and deeper into the into the warmer parts of the of the ocean. Or I guess I shouldn't say deeper, but they can come more to the surface. I should say. Um, but that's a whole different story. I mean, <laughs> that's that's the Fallen Empire lore. Well, so this is this is interesting for me. Uh, a really nice card, of course. A lot, well, nice. A lot of uh, uh, decks, especially in EC. Or, or Brute, you've got the famous Rack deck where you're playing with Hims and the Rack. So the Rack was actually one of Mishra's earlier inventions. And the nice thing of that is that later on we'll find, or actually it's here, we'll find Cursed Rack. And uh, Cursed Rack was actually an invention by uh, the apprentice of Mishra, and that's Ashnot. So Ashnot invented several torture techniques that could make uh, victims even miles away back for mercy as if the end had come. So this is something different. And that's quite nice. So it's really, again, there's so much flavor and referencing here in the set. Let me be careful here that I don't damage my own collection. 
there we go. Another card that you have to talk about when you're talking about uh, antiquities, of course, is this one, the Millstone. I remember when this came out, I thought this card was just insane because you would mill away two cards of your opponent and the opponent could not use those cards anymore. At least that's what I used to think. I didn't realize that, um, you know, the opponent would simply get another card instead of the two cards you milled. And my, my thought, it was like, if I could mill his key cards, his big creatures, I've won the game. If I could mill away his Sheevan Dragon, I wasn't even thinking about milling somebody, which of course we know now as decking. But the Millstone really brought a whole new uh, win con to the game of Magic. So it's really, really interesting design. And there we see Thomas's coffin again. This, I, I, okay, so to everybody out there, if you're building a deck uh, with the Candelabra of Thomas and you can combine it with the rocket launcher, then you're really, then you're really a badass in my book. The interesting thing about rocket launcher is every time you pay two, you can deal a damage to another target and it doesn't destroy itself until the end of the turn. So that could be useful. Just saying, just saying. There we've got Thomas's wand, we've got Thomas's coffin, we've got Thomas's weaponry. So all of these, of course, refer to Thomas. Triskelion refers to Thomas. Considering Thomas made Triskelion, he probably also made the Tetravite. Uh, so the Tetravus. So that's kind of an interesting thing as well to think about. And you've got Urza's adventure, so his war machine. Not so impressive, Urza, your war machine. I think your apprentice did a better job with Triskelion, but that's just my opinion. And here we go. And then we go into the colors. We haven't really discussed those. Um, each card in um, Antiquities is connected. There's a connection with artifacts, making this quite unique. And also Martyrs is, is quite an interesting card because it, it's a bodyguard. It soaks up all the damage done to you by artifacts. So when you would use this, for example, with the Copper Tablet, you would get damage from the Copper Tablet, but that would go to the Martyrs of Corliss instead. So you wouldn't get that damage. Um, yeah, Hercules Recall, yeah, beautiful card, very useful, offensive and defensively. Draftness Restoration, I'm not, it, it is unique in a sense that you can take multiple cards from your, from your graveyard and just get them back in the game somehow. Um, but, it's also difficult because you're putting them on top of your own library. So I'm not quite sure how to feel about this card. I'm almost like it should be useful, but if it would be an instant, it would be a lot, 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 lot better. Um, let's take a look. What else do we have? Of course, these very powerful power artifact. And of course, you've got that Basil Monolith power artifact decks. Very nice card, very cool. It's just really nice like the, what these what these cards do, you know, enchant artifact. Do you even have enchant artifact still? Very interesting. These these cards, you know, they all kind of invite you to brew. Well, not so much as the, the power artifact anymore since it's always connected with that Basil Monolith combo, but maybe, you know, maybe you can do something new with it. And very badly centered, but hey man, I've got it, I've got the set. Very badly centered transmute artifact. Transmute Artifact, fantastic card for two blue. Uh, you can search for your library for one artifact and immediately place it into play. Also choose any artifact in play that you control and place it in its owner's graveyard. If the new artifact has a casting cost greater than that of the discarded one, you must pay the difference or Transmute Artifact fails and both artifacts are discarded. Shuffle your library after playing this card. So what you could actually do as well, it's also a way of get of getting two artifacts into your graveyard if you don't want to pay, if, if you choose an artifact and, you, and you're not going to pay for its casting cost. So not sure how that's relevant, but I mean, who knows? Some kind of weird situation, but usually it's just a great tutor for an artifact in your deck. And of course, uh, there are a lot of powerful artifacts, Chaos Orb, just to name one of them uh, in old school magic. Um, okay, then we've got Gate to Phyrexia, that's quite an interesting one. Let me take it out. Um, this is a, uh, let's have a look. It's an enchantment, two black, 
and it reads sacrifice one of your creatures during your upkeep to destroy any one artifact and you may not sacrifice a creature that's already on its way to the graveyard. Now we haven't really talked about Phyrexia. Um, Phyrexia is pretty connected because um, remember when I talked about the brothers going to the caves of Koilos where they find the power stone that breaks into these two separate stones. What happens there as well is there's a portal there to Phyrexia and uh, in the plane of Phyrexia, there are a lot of strong artifacts. For example, the dragon engine that uh, Mishra controls comes from the plane of Phyrexia. So um, at a certain point in the story, Mishra goes back to the caves of Koilos. He goes through the portal to Phyrexia. There he gets attacked by Gix. He manages to escape, but Gix um, goes after him and eventually manages to disrupt Mishra and kind of take, take him over. And um, what happens next is that Urza feels forced to use the Golgathian Silex and pretty much destroys everything, killing Mishra, killing the armies, and, and Gix actually flees. But that is a whole different story. There's just so much lore to it. Let's see what else um, do we have here on this page. Um, we see some other nice cards here. Oh yeah, Phyrexian Gremlins. That's it's so funny. It's the art of this. It's it's one of the few cards in black that can actually do something against artifacts. Basically, it's a relic barrier, but then it's a creature and it's black and it's one mana more because it's black and two. So tap gremlins uh, to tap an artifact as long as gremlins remain tapped and in play. Uh, that artifact does not untap as normal during its controller's untap phase. You may choose not to untap gremlins during your untap phase. And, when we look at the art, let's see if I can do some miracle work with the camera. Okay, okay, that's not too bad. Mm, yeah, so I guess when we look at the art, look at how cool those little gremlins look. <laughs> there are many as well. Woo -woo. Very cool card, very cool card. Of course, by Amy Weber. Beautiful art. So, so much going on in these in these older cards. Uh, so let's take a look. I would, yeah. Here we've got Yakmov Demon. Yakmov is an, another whole character. We could do a whole. We could do a whole episode about Yakmov. Yakmov Demon. Nice little card. Like six six flying first strike. There are not that many cards in black that have first strike. But of course, during your upkeep, you have to um, sacrifice one of your artifacts. The, the, the big problem for me with Yakmov is, is, you know, not the two damage that it does when you cannot destroy an artifact, um, but the fact that it taps itself. If you would just get two damage, if, if you cannot destroy an artifact, then the, the card will be so much better. Uh, and then we see, of course, red with the, with the famous Atok. It, Atog is one of those guy, one of those cards that I'm really like, lore wise. I'm not quite sure how it fits in with antiquities. Um, but maybe you can let me know. Oh, this is uh, it's cool. Like, Sitinol, the word Sitinol, you can actually spell lunatic with the same letters. So it's actually a lunatic druid. It's just a, a lunatic. It's just. Uh, and it's also said in the flavor text, driven mad by the fall of Argoth, the Sentinel Druid found peace only in battle. So it's just crazy. I'm guessing in green again has a lot of cards. Crumble you see often being played, but also Titania's Song is just a beautiful card. If we look at that art. Stunning and also what it does it and changing all non artifact creatures in play lose all their abilities and they become Artifact creatures with toughness and power equal to their casting cost. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing And the cool thing is and this for me That's this last part if Titania song leaves play artifacts return to their normal Just before the untap phase of the next turn. So that means that, that entire turn they stay the same so it's not like um, I'm going to attack with all my now living non-artifacts that are now artifact creatures. So I'm going to attack with my Icy Manipulator, for example, that's now 4-4. And then my opponent says, you know what, I'm going to disenchant your song. And now your Icy is tapped, but it's no longer attacking. No, that's not the case because it stays a creature until the end of the next untap phase. So it's, it's really, really interesting. 
it, it makes it more powerful. Now here we have the lands. We kind of discussed them already. Of course, we've got the uh, the famous strip mines. In old school, there's always the discussion. Four strip mines, one strip mine. Again, very badly centered, but hey, I'm happy that I have all four. This is the one with the little tower. And um, yeah, it's nice. So this uh, this was it. This was my little video about antiquities. Um, if you'd like to know more about these, by the way, these are um, about these cards. Uh, I'll put a link. There's probably a link popping up right now, and you can have a look at that video where I kind of show uh, these cards to you. Um, but yeah, and you can see one of my favorite cards <laughs> in the antiquities expansion is Sage of Latin. I just think he's a very cool dude. Um, thank you for watching uh, this episode of Timmy Talks where we've talked about uh, antiquities and the whole set of antiquities. Uh, let me know again if you enjoy these videos and if you'd like me to share more um, sets with you. Unfortunately, I don't have all the sets, I wish, but I have, of course, more cards in my collection. Um, so let me know if you'd like me to, uh, to share them with you. And um, for now, thank you for watching Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And um, if you want to support the channel, you can do so by liking, leaving a message. Um, and of course, uh, you can also share this video on your socials. That really helps. Subscribe if you're not a subscriber uh, yet. All of that really, really uh, helps and supports the channel. Um, what else can you do? Oh yeah, we also have a Patreon page, of course. Almost forgot about that. Uh, where you can support me and Timmy Talks financially. So you can click on the link, you know, have a look, see if it's something for you. For you. If not, no worries. Talking about uh, Patreon, let's go to the end scroll. Let's take a look at the patrons of Timmy Talks. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ich bin